Good morning. Good morning. So glad to have you with us this uh, morning. And uh, we're so thankful to have Rich with us here on the praise team. Uh, he's been filling in for uh, Alan Allen, who has been on vacation, a much needed one. And so we're just so thankful that Rich has come all the way from Crown Point, right? Yep. All the way down and uh, has come to worship with us uh, last week and this week too. And so we're so thankful. Thank you for being here. And we're thankful for our praise team as well. <laughs> we love our praise team. Um, we've been blessed. Amen. Yeah, exactly. We are blessed to have a praise team uh, like we have here. Uh, just a few things as we begin this morning. Remember tomorrow, right here, 6 p.m., we have Celebrate Recovery, and it's for anybody who has any hurts, hang-ups, or habits that you're struggling with. And uh, basically what you do is you come in here, we sing some worship songs, we pray, we have a Bible lesson that goes along with what uh, step that they're doing in the program, and then we break off into groups. Men go in one section of the church, women go in the other section of the church, and they uh, just talk about what's going on. And it's a non-judgmental place that you can just get support and, and help one another. And so if you're struggling with something, you want to be a part of that, please come uh, tomorrow at 6. We also have another Sunday school class going on. Um, if you want to be a part of our Sunday school, both of our Sunday schools are at second hour, so you'll have to wake up a little bit early, get here first service, and then go 
uh, second service. But right now, not only do we have Tim Overmeyer, who is teaching over here in the White House, uh, but now we have Ken Stiles, who is back, and he is teaching upstairs in the classroom right next to the um, offices. So, so if you want to be a part of that, he's teaching Ephesians right now, and so you can be a part of that. And then finally, on Tuesdays at 2 o'clock here in the church, um, we have a group of people meeting to come and pray. And basically they pray over the church, pray over the country, pray over prayer requests from the youth. You know, they even take the youth's prayer requests and, and they pray over those. And so if you want to be a part of a prayer group um, and you have that opportunity uh, to come at 2 o'clock on Tuesdays, we'd love you to come. Anybody's welcome. Just come and pray with us and uh, be a part of that important group. As we go to the Lord in praise this morning, let's bow our heads and let us pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for this day, a day that you have given us, a day that we can rejoice and be glad in. Lord, I pray right now as we enter into this time of worship that you would just fill this place. Jesus, we invite you in here. Holy Spirit, come and fill our hearts, and we'll give you all the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Culture changes. Situations change. People change. Let's all stand together if you would. But the word of God and the promise... And this question is the same throughout the ages. Have you been to Jesus for the cleansing power? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you fully trusting in His grace, His sorrow? Thank you. 
I'm gonna let y'all sit down on this next one. It's a new song. Alan said it's been on your list, so if you want, feel free to sit if you want and get a breath, and then we'll stand up on the next song. But uh, this one is called Graves into Gardens, and it is, uh, if you've listened to VFR and much, it's on there, I understand, and uh, it's a great new song from Elevation Worship. So uh, we're gonna do it for you today. I search the world, but it couldn't fill me. And man's empty praise and treasures that fade are never enough. But then you Thank you. 
That's a great song, great song today. Let's all stand and sing this last song together. You know the marvel of who God is and that he cares about us. And I shared a little bit last week about uh, life and the valleys and trials. But the one thing that I can stand here today and tell you that is that God is with us. And he's even with us in our worst of times. He says he'll never leave us and never forsake us. And that's a promise we have to hold on to. Even if you're caught in something you think you'll never get out of, just keep holding on. Keep pressing into God. Keep holding on and press repeat, repeat, repeat. Who are we? That you would be mindful of us. What do you see? It's worth looking our way We are free In ways that we never should be Sweet release From the grip of this chain Such a tiny offering. Yet he 
Sprinkles about us. Compared to Calvary, never the less. Lay beside your feet. All that is within me, Christ, for you alone. Be glorified, be man you help. God with One more time. God with us. All that is within me, Christ, for you alone. Be glorified, Emmanuel. God with us. My heart sings a brand new song. struggling with something? Are you dealing with something that just seems like it's so insurmountable? It's so, it's such, such a struggle so big that you just can't deal with it. You know you have a Lord and Savior who wants to help you. You have a God who cares and loves for you. And this morning, whatever it may be, if you just feel like you want to come before the Lord and just bring that concern, that worry, won't you come as we sing? Seeking you as 
was a precious jewel Lord, to give up I'd be a fool You are my all in all Jesus, Lamb of God Worthy is your name Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this opportunity once again to be in your house. And we thank you, Father, that you're a good, good Father who loves us, who listens to us, who cares for us. And we thank you, Jesus, that you were willing to come and do the Father's will. And you were willing to come and die upon the cross that we might be saved. And we thank you, Holy Spirit, just for your presence in our lives daily encouraging us, daily enabling, enabling us, cur, uh, daily just comforting our hearts. We just thank you for your presence, Holy Spirit. And Lord, I just pray today for those who have knelt before you, those who stand before you today, whatever may be on their hearts, whatever may be on their minds, whatever they may be lifting up to you, Lord, that you would lend your ear, you would listen to them, and they might see your grace work in their lives. Lord, I pray as we turn our attention to the word this morning. Lord, I pray we'd open our ears, open our eyes, open our minds, but mostly open our hearts. That we might receive the word today. And Lord, we might be changed because of what you have done for us. We thank you, Father, for all that you do. We pray this in Jesus' name. We had a little bit of mic trouble last uh, last service. So I want to make sure my mic is well. Thank you, Wes. I want to make sure our mic is well this time, uh, that we're doing okay. In northern China, there is a bridge. And you may have heard of this or you may not have heard of this, but there's a bridge. And this bridge has got a really neat design. It, ha- it, it hugs a cliff that's over 8,000 feet in the air. And it's about 750 uh, feet uh, long. And basically, as you're walking on this bridge, it is made of glass so that you can see the valley below. And tourists come uh, from all over to come to this bridge in China to see this bridge. But what they don't know most of the first time 
uh, visitors, is that the creators of the bridge, the designers of this bridge, wanted to play a little prank, a little trick on those who like to walk out on this bridge. So I want to show you a video this morning of this bridge and people walking over this bridge. So not only do they have this bridge over this uh, huge uh, valley, but they decided to put a prank in there, the designers did, and they put uh, this computer image that would make it look like the bridge is cracking, and they also put sound effects. So you didn't hear it there, but they had sound effects of glass actually cracking. So people are thinking this bridge is going to collapse underneath them. They put their faith and their trust in these designers, and they're pulling a prank. I mean, it's scary enough. You saw some of them before even they got to that point. They're grabbing all, and they're having to drag people, let alone think that the bridge is cracking and, and, and going to fall from underneath them. And I think about that, and I think about our walk with God. How many times we are supposed to have faith, but yet as we're walking along life, we don't always put our faith and trust in Him. We get distracted, we think the bridge is cracking, and we don't realize there is one that is holding up that we can for sure put all of our trust and our faith and our hope in, and that's Jesus Christ. And that's what I want to talk about this morning. So if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Hebrews chapter 10, starting at verse 19. Hebrews chapter 10, starting at verse 19. Pastor Mike and I have been... Um, we read a book together, and uh, we discuss it um, every uh, once a week on Mondays, and we decided to take a, um, a commentary for the first time and read through a commentary on Hebrews together and talk and discuss, 
And so we've been discussing Hebrews for a while, and I just feel that God has placed this on my heart to speak with you today from Hebrews. It says, Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way opened for us through the curtain that is his body, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with the full assurance that faith brings, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he promised is faithful. And let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. The commentary that we've been reading together calls the Hebrew writer pastor. And as you read through Hebrews, you begin to understand why this commentator calls him a pastor. Because the, he really writes this letter out of a pastor's heart for the church. He sees a church that is struggling in faith. He sees a church that is facing unprecedented times in their day and their age. And he wants to reassure them that the Christ that they put their faith in is a God who can be trusted and could be faithful to us. And so he's worried about this. He's worried about their lack of confidence and their waning faith in Jesus Christ. You see, during that time and that age, there was a lot of things that could uh, take you away from your faith in the early church. There were heresies a lot of heresies in that day, heresies about Jesus, heresies that brought Jewish traditions into the church, even circumcision, and uh, the church really struggled with a lot of false teachers and a, lost, uh, a lot of false prophets coming in and trying to sway people away from Christ. And they dealt with persecution. They dealt with persecution. It first started with the Jewish people, and then it went to the Romans, uh, that persecuted the church, and so they faced a lot of people who walked away from the faith because of persecution. And can I say it? I think throughout all the centuries, there are some that they come to Christ, but then they get into the monotony of life. They begin focusing on other things than God himself, focusing on things than Christ himself, and they fall away as well. And we don't know exactly what was going on that the pastor here writes, but we do understand that he's afraid that they're going to fall away. Earlier in the book of Hebrews in chapter 3, it said, so as the Holy Spirit says today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as you did in the rebellion during the time of the testing in the wilderness where your ancestors tested and tried me, though for 40 years they saw what I did. That is why I, am, I was angry with the generation. And I said, their hearts are always going astray, and they have not known my ways. I declare on oath in my anger, they shall never enter my rest." The Hebrews writer is, is, is quoting Psalms, which is talking about the incident of the Israelites. The Israelites, as you know, got to the promised land. They were going to go in, and they sent the spies, the 12 spies, and 10 of them came back and said, their cities are too big, uh, the people in there are too tall, there's no way we can defeat them, there's no way we can occupy this land. And the people's hearts rebelled against God. They didn't trust God. They were afraid. And they said, how can we do this? And they forgotten the God who had delivered them from Egypt, the God who had parted the Red Sea and, and, and swallowed up Pharaoh and his armies, how quickly they had forgotten and forgotten where they put their faith and their trust in. And the Hebrews writer saying, hey, just like they did, don't do the same thing. Don't wane in your faith. Don't, don't sit there and allow your faith to be shaken because in the end, you're never going to be able to enter the rest. 
the rest of God where it comes in eternity. You see, faith is needed in our walk with Christ. Faith is needed, and if we wane in our faith, we also can't enter into that final rest, that eternity with Him. See, as we journey with Christ, there's a lot of things that are easy to stray us from faith. There are a lot of things, just like back in that day, there's still things today that can cause us to stray from our faith. Have you ever heard of this thing called highway hypnosis? Have you ever heard about this? They've done some research on this, uh, scientists have. And basically what it is, is as you're driving along, say you see a sign that says 60 miles to the next town, and then you come to the next sign that says 20 miles from the town, from, from that, that length of time, from that 60 sign to that 20 sign, you know you're driving, you know that you have been driving, but you can't remember how you got from that 60 sign to that 20 sign. And what they call that is, 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 is highway hypnosis because the monotony of the drive, especially on long drives where the scenery never changes, as you're going through that monotony of driving, your mind switches off. It switches kind of in, a, in a, a cruise control mode, and you're not as attentive anymore. Though you are still driving, though you're still knowing it's a, an important thing to keep your eyes on the road, your mind switches off. And you forget kind of how you got from that one space to the other. I think it's the same thing in our walk with Christ. Sometimes we get life hypnosis if we're not careful. We get life hypnosis, and that can help, that can cause us to stray from Christ. And I think one of those things is inattention to God. We don't spend enough time with God during our day. Eight hours we sleep, or you should sleep around eight hours. So let's say if you get the, the normal eight hours of sleep, you know, that leaves you with 16 hours in the day. How many of those hours do you really spend with God in prayer, in your Bible, thinking of God, thinking of His ways? And I think that coupled with the monotony of life can cause a lot of problems for Christians. We get wrapped up in the monotony of life all of the little things that take our time and take, our, uh, take from us. And we get so focused in on life and the worries of life and the, and the pleasures of life and the struggles of life and all of these things, and it's not intentional, but if we're not paying attention, can lead us away from God. I tell couples that come in for marriage counseling, the first thing is, is you didn't reach this place overnight. Typically, they'll come in and they'll have a big issue that's happened in their lives and we begin to talk about it, but the thing that they don't realize is that that thing wasn't actually causing the real problem in their marriage. The real problem was the fact that they hadn't paid attention to each other for 10 or 20 years or how many years they've been together. They weren't attentive to their wives or they weren't attentive to their husbands and they had been drifting away for a long time. It's just now that they realize and it's the same thing with our walk with Jesus if we're not careful. And I think it's the lack of spiritual growth in our walk with Christ that can cause us to wane in our faith. Listen to what the pastor says here in Hebrews 5. He says, we have much to say about this, but it is hard to make it clear to you because you no longer try to understand. In fact, though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you the elementary truths of God's word all over again. You need milk, not solid food. Anyone who lives on milk, being still an infant, is not acquainted with the teaching about righteousness. But solid food is for the mature, who by constant use have trained themselves to distinguish good from evil. He said, part of your problem is you continue to, to not even learn the elementary truths of your faith. You're not growing in your faith. In fact, by now you should be teachers. I shouldn't be telling you this again. Have you ever had that as parents? How many times do I have to tell you this? 
I told you this like three times. Come on. And yet I, I, could, I could almost see the frustration the pastor here is saying, look, guys, I've taught you this already. You should be well past this. We should be teachers here. You should be teaching other people rather than me coming back and having to teach you again. And that means that we have to grow in our spiritual walk in the same way. And then I think finally, with this life hypnosis, we allow Satan to put doubt and fear in our hearts. First Peter says, be alert and, so, and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. It's like that bridge. We're going along in life and we see a crack in the bridge. And we're getting freaked out, you know. We're grabbing the side of the railing. Somebody's having to, God's coming along trying to pull our arm. Come on, come on. And we're freaked out and we're anxi anxiety and fearful and, and, and just go, oh. And God's saying, stop. I've got you. Don't worry. I've got you. Just put your faith in me and tell Satan to get behind you because I have got you. We have to have that faith. That when Satan comes, we say, no, Satan, I know in whom I put my trust, and I know he is faithful, and he is going to see me through. Amen. You see, to walk with Christ, we must have faith. To walk with Christ, we must have faith. That is the only requirement in salvation alone is faith. Nothing else we need to do. Just have faith. We have to have a faith that Jesus has saved us. Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, open for us through the curtain, that is his body. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, we have been saved by Jesus when we put our faith in what he did for us on the cross. Through his body hanging on the cross, through his blood that was shed, we know that we can be saved because he did that for us and we put our faith in that alone. If anybody tells you anything else of salvation, it is wrong because it is by faith that we are saved alone. Listen to what John 3, 16 and beyond says. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Now listen, church, listen to this. Verse 18, whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only son. Right there. I am no longer condemned because I believe what Jesus did on the cross has saved me and now I am justified. Paul says, for it is, it is by grace you have been saved through faith and this is not from yourselves. It is a gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast. So this morning, if you do not know Jesus Christ in your heart, those who are sitting here or those who are on Facebook today, and you say, you know what, I am tired of living in sin. I am tired. I realize that I am offending God. I realize that I'm sinning against God. And I realize that there is no way that I can enter into that eternal peace with him. And I need him in my life today. All you need to do is get on your knees, confess your sins, and believe that Jesus has saved you and you will be saved today. Salvation can come today. But it's not just that. It's not just a faith in salvation. We have a faith in the hope that Jesus gives us. We have promises that we can hold on to. We have the promise of eternity with him. That one day, no longer do we have to strive and toil anymore, but we will be in his peace forever. We have an eternal hope that no matter what I face in this world around me today, I can hope and have faith that there will be a day when I will be with him in eternity. And we have a hope for tomorrow. Psalm 35, that's the psalm that we've been reading a lot um, 
in the last few weeks here through this whole pandemic and all of this rioting and all of the natural disaster, everything going on. Um, we've quoted this a couple times, but I quote it again today. For his anger lasts a moment, but his favor lasts a lifetime. Weeping may stay for the night, but rejoicing comes in the morning. Every day is new in Christ. And we may go through the valley, but that God that was the God of the mountain is still the God in the valley. He's going to see you through. Remember what David said. Yea, though I walk through the shadow, the valley, the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. A promise that we know that no matter what we face, God is going to be there with us. But we also um, have a hope that we can approach God with our concerns. If we have faith, we know we have this hope that we can approach God with our concerns. Listen to what it said in Hebrews 10, 19. We have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus. It was only the priest who could take the prayers and take the sacrifices and go into the most holy place. It was only the priest who could do that in the Old Testament. But when Jesus came and died on the cross, we now have access to the Father through Jesus. No longer do we need somebody to pray for us. We can go directly to Jesus with all of our concerns, directly to the Father. And, and, and we can have faith that God will hear us and God will answer us. We can have that hope and that faith today. And we have faith that Jesus can transform our lives. You know, I think that's probably one of the hardest things for Christians to believe. We're okay in believing that God can save us from our sins. He can forgive us, but transform us? I think we struggle sometimes with that. We think, oh no, God, you don't know how strong my sin is. You don't know how strong my temptations are. You don't know how, how flawed my character is. But Jesus did not just come to, to, to save us from the guilt of sin. He came to transform us and change us through the cross. Amen. And the thing is, is that we, we get so hung up on, we have to do it. No, we couldn't forgive ourselves, so how can we transform ourselves? Rather, we got to allow God's grace not only to save us, but to change us by having faith that Jesus can do it because he secured that victory on the cross. He secured that victory for us on the cross. Hebrews 10, 14, it says, For by one sacrifice he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. That word perfect isn't a static perfect. In the Greek, that word's a little bit different. See, in our language, we think of perfect like a perfect day or a perfect family event, or just put that perfect in wherever you want to put it, perfect picture, perfect outfit. But rather, what this means is, is more of a, a concept of perfecting, a continuous process that the Holy Spirit is doing inside of our hearts if we have faith and allow God's grace to do that, Amen. that we can find victory in Jesus Christ, not over the guilt of our sins, but sin itself in our lives. I'm going to do this a little bit different. Last time I, I, I asked somebody to come up, but it didn't work out the way I was hoping. So I'll do it myself today. I got two things with me this morning. I first have a Hershey's bar. Amen. <laughs> you love Hershey's bar, right? Yeah. You, know, you take a look at this Hershey bar, and, and, and if you ever eat a Hershey bar, you put chocolate in there. It's sweet, isn't it? Mm -hmm. That's good tasting. Mm. Oh, you should, you should experience this. This is great this morning. <laughs> but that's kind of like God's grace when we come in salvation we come to salvation it's like that candy bar we get the taste of his grace that takes our sins away we find that freedom for the first time we find that and it's, it's sweet and it's good but what God says is that's just the start of how sweet and how great my grace is. You just got a taste. When I was walking around uh, Walmart, I came across this new product. I had never seen it before. 
And this, my friends, is a Hershey's cupcake. It has a chocolate shell with a chocolate cake inside with a cream filling that's made of chocolate. Oh, amen. <laughs> amen, indeed. And I tell you, you bite into this thing. Oh, my word. So much better than just a chocolate bar. So much deeper, so much richer. And as we walk along with God, I think that if we allow His grace to really work in our hearts, and we begin to really experience that grace, how much deeper it can go if we allow it to transform our lives. Amen. We can have faith that God, uh, Jesus can transform, not just give us salvation, but salvation going on and transforming us. Give me a minute. I bit off more than I can chew there. <laughs> but this morning, if this is the faith that we should have, then we must realize we have to have a faith that preserves. And if we have a faith that preserves, how, what can we do this morning to have that faith? The first thing, and this comes right from the passage, the, uh, the pastor of Hebrews tells us, let's draw near. That's the first thing. He says, let's draw near. That means that we have to have time with God. We need to, A, if we've not given our hearts to the Lord, give our hearts to, our, to the Lord, have faith that he saved us. But once we start that journey, we need to spend time with him, spend time in his word, spend time in prayer, spend time together as a church. We spend time learning about him and knowing him and not just learning with our minds, but allowing that to flow into our hearts and we live it out. Because as we live it out, we see that his word is true and how much better our lives can be. We also have to learn to discern God's voice. And as we draw near to him, we, we can begin to hear his voice. When we realize what is good and what is righteous, we know that God will only say something to us that is a, within his word and that is good and righteous. And as we learn good and righteous, we can learn what God is saying to us, what God is leading us to do, and we can go deeper with those things in our lives that God says, I want you to deal with because we're listening to him, and we respond. And we respond by allowing God's grace to change you. We have to draw near. But we also says, we, he says, we have, let us hold fast. Let us hold fast. As we draw near to him, we allow ourselves to hold fast in our faith, holding on to the promises that he is with us in the hard times, holding on to the promises that he will see us through there, and if it isn't seeing us through in this life, he will see us through into eternity with him. Amen. To trust that God has us, to not flail along on that bridge, but to walk confidently because God has our hand and is leading us through. And this means that we need to know God's word, not just in our heads, but in our hearts. When we have those verses in our hearts, when Satan comes and tries to, to put doubt in our minds, say, no, we have confidence. We know what Jesus has done, because this is what God's word says. When Satan says, God doesn't care about you. No, this is what God's word says. I know and I trust and I believe that God loves me, even though right now I'm going through a dark time. And I may not feel his presence completely. He is there. Knowing God's word, not just in our heads, but in our hearts. And then the last thing he says is, let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds. That means meeting together. Meeting together as a body. A lot of times we think coming to church is about this. And it is. That relationship with God, it is coming to church to praise him, to worship him, to hear the word. But there's another aspect of church, and it's this. And it's the relationship with one another. That is, as a church, we should be coming together, encouraging one another, loving one another, helping one another, spurring one another on in love and good deeds. 
Because God gave us the church to do that. He didn't leave us just by ourselves, but he gave us the church so that we could help one another and be encouraging. And it's so important that we meet together so that we can do that with one another. And if you're meeting and you're not doing that, I encourage you to do that. That's what God wants us to do, and that will help not just your faith, but help the faith of others that are around you. So if you're in need, let somebody encourage you. If you see somebody in need, encourage them, because that's what the church is about. Let me end with this. There was a young man named Mirka. He grew up living in Romania. And he lived in Romania in a time when it was uh, the communist rule. And during that day, they had a dictator that was over Romania, and he uh, persecuted the church heavily. There was a lot of persecution. Not a lot of people were, not missionaries weren't allowed to come in. There wasn't a lot of teaching and preaching out there. Churches were persecuted. But yet, young Mirka grew up in a household where his dad was a stout communist and his mom was a devout Christian. And growing up, he kind of went back and forth trying to see where he was going to end up. But it was his mom's faith and his mom's uh, just his, his mom's character that won him over for Christ. And so he began reading his Bible, and at the age of 23, he accepted the Lord in his heart. You think everything's great and peachy, right? Well, he's still underneath this uh, Romanian-controlled uh, government, so he couldn't really learn a lot about Christ, but he wanted to draw near. He wanted to learn more. And so he would find uh, some materials every once in a while from the navigators, and uh, that's a discipleship group. And he would read them whenever he would get a hold of some of that material. But at the same time, there was another uh, organization called Entrust. They were sending Christian leaders into countries where they weren't really allowed. They would sneak them in and teach um, people of the church to be leaders and pastors and things of that sort. And, and young Mirka was so wanting to know about God that he found out about this. He started meeting with these leaders. But he sh soon found there was an issue. These leaders didn't speak his language. They, sp they spoke English, and so he struggled with that. So, and, and those who were um, with him were struggling, so he taught himself English so that he could understand what those people were saying so he could learn about God. And his first class, he was so excited, was on Galatians and Romans, learning about Galatians and Romans. There was another issue that came up they realized that the materials that they had, because they had to sneak in, they only had one copy of their materials. So they didn't have a copy machine. They didn't have a Xerox. They didn't have a Staples that they could go and get copies. So Mirka would hand copy those materials so that he and others could read the materials that they were bringing about the Bible. And he went along in these classes for years until 1989 when the police arrested him. The police arrested him and they began to beat Mirka under false accusations in order to try to find out others in the church. But Mirka would not give up the names. Mirka stayed in prison and was beaten for the faith. But fortunately for Mirka, though he did not know it, six weeks after his incarceration, away from his family and his wife, there was a coup in Romania, and the communist government was thrown out, and he was released, and then believers were allowed to go and meet once again. And today, Mirka is an assistant pastor in a church in Romania. You know, there was a lot of struggles to come to faith for Mirka. And at any time, he could have said, I've had enough of this. Who is this God? I mean, I'm struggling here, I'm struggling there. Whether it's struggling to, to learn about him and having to learn all of these things and do all these things so he could get the materials that he needed. Being thrown into prison and beaten, he could say, I have enough of this. I want to go home with my family. I want to be with my wife. But Mirka 
had faith in God and that faith would lead him through. And that same faith is available for us today. All we need to do is put our trust in God. And believe me, God will never fail you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this time together. We thank you for all that you have done for us. Lord, I pray right now as we go forth through this week that you would go before us, watch over us, and keep us. Help us, Lord, to come back next week praising you once again. And we do all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Go with God this week.